Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Mog here, Mog Morgan, companion of Set and Knight of Shambhala. And this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. So for this episode, I'm focusing on the topic of Horus, who is the god associated with this lunar month in the uh, ritual year that we follow. Uh, I think I've already reposted uh, the video that I did from last time, but this one's a little bit different, do a few different things. I wanted to start by uh, talking a little bit about the the thing I've got on my background, which is the so-called Abydos fetish, and it shows uh, it's from uh, Abydos from the mortuary temple of Seti the First, which is one of the world's masterpieces, I suppose, of art as well as Egyptian culture. It shows King Seti the First offering incense to the sacred emblem of Osiris, which once stood in the temple. Uh, this is what I mean by the fetish object. You can see it there. Uh, it is a container that holds the head of Osiris surmounted by two plumes uh, held aloft on a high pillar, which is protected at its base by Ruti, the double-headed lion of the earth, uh, standing wrapped in divine wings. And there are six emblems on poles that stand either side of the, uh, of, of the standard. So the, th the thing about this quite complicated image that people often make quite a lot of for good reason is that it represents the head of Osiris, which, as you know, in the, in the myth, or perhaps I should say in the myth, Osiris is dismembered into multiple parts, and these are parts are distributed up and down the length of Egypt, and the head is held at Abydos, which is a main cult center of Osiris as well, so that's all sorts of significances in that. It was used probably the, the fetish underground ritual in the Osirion once a year uh, when the whole thing was reproduced uh, or reassembled rather. The, the image I'm showing is a, actually a, a, a painting from the uh, Temple of Seti I at Abydos, which was kind of painted by Amis Calvary uh, with the assistance of various people who were excavating the tomb. She was working, obviously, as an artist on the site. And the paintings and drawings, of which there are quite a lot, are uh, quite a masterpiece in its own right. The thing that connects this image with, what I'm, with Horus and what I'm going to talk about in various ways in the course of this, this podcast is that it will come up later, is, is this fetish. Uh, and, and objects similar to it are used in connection with a ritual of Horus as well, as we're, as we're going to discover. So I thought I'd mention that uh, uh, by way of also discussing uh, some bits of aspects of Egyptian culture, which is quite complicated. So for this episode, uh, apart from that, I recorded some of this earlier as a guide to a particular ritual. So I should say that I do um, run a kind of a course uh, over the course of a year, or there's a there's a you can do a one-off version of it, which is done as a a kind of guide to the book uh, Egyptian Magic. Uh, uh, a spirited guide as kind of video that would be connected with that that you could see as that as a sort of course of one lesson and there'd be a, a cost for that apart from the cost of the book but i also do follow the sequence so the book itself has this sequence of 12 and 13 different rituals and i do uh 
uh, a taught version of that in which rather than talking in the generalities i kind of talk about the kind of actual nuts and bolts of the rituals that we do and that we create based on ancient sources for each of those months and i have various approaches to that and guides to that so perhaps i thought it might be interesting as there's a sort of overlaps a number of different issues that the the kind of way i approach it the sort of analysis and guidance to the ritual practice that i give uh in each of these classes i actually made it, what what happens is that i produce a kind of a, a, a lecture or a phase lecture of about two parts which goes into the the construction of a particular ritual uh this time around i ended up doing three parts and this and the, and the third part of which i thought i could as it kind of head edged off i thought it would be interesting to uh share that with you so that's that's the explanation for the kind of unusual format of it it is explaining after the fact certain aspects of how you accomplish the ritual to uh horus that's been given which is based on a a, a ritual a lamp ritual uh from um the pgm the so-called pgm or the the magical papyri i'll move it to one side now so you can see the fetish part uh that i mentioned that's just just behind me there it's quite a complex beautiful beautiful image i have to move back because the microphone okay so that's uh what I'm going to do, I'm going to play you the, the the episode that I already made, and I'm going to. Um, so I flip the image there the other the other way. It was it was uh, for some reason the program I use had it the wrong way around. Anyway, now I've got the actual fetish showing to my where well, my on my shoulder, and you can see it there as described a kind of pillar with various figures around it so it's a giant fetish with this kind of uh cover on top of it and the plumes on top of that and underneath that because quite a taboo uh theme and an object would be the head of osiris in some form or other or envisages that uh perhaps another type of object and this would be taken into the Osirian and, and used in ritual. And there is a kind of connection between this image and the ritual of Horus. As I say, we explored in a couple of different films uh, and in the, the little film that I'm going to show in, in the ritual. It actually kind of plays quite a, quite a part, really. Let's say we, we, in the, the ritual and in the month, it, we were exploring the mysteries of uh, lamp magic or magic to do with lights. Uh, and this is kind of a rich tapestry of the ancient Egyptian tradition. The god Horus emerges in numerous forms, each offering unique insights into the realm of magic. Uh, we dealt with Horus the Elder and Horus the Younger. These uh, were divine entities uh, which had different parentage in terms of the uh, different tradition and characteristics, and each have special things to teach to magic. Uh, the ritual that we explored and we developed for this month uh, is to do with uh, using the, the lamp as a gateway to ancient magic, uh, culminating on the full moon, which is another kind of lamp in a way, uh, but specifically the use of a lamp which i show in the little film that i'm gonna sort of add at the end of this it's often overlooked the significance of this sort of magic uh, in the ancient world it far surpasses any sort of utilitarian function that uh, a lot of merely providing light the actual lamps themselves have a kind of very special ritual function and, and come up in all sorts of rituals not just in egypt uh, all over the kind of Near East, uh, the rituals of the lamp 
as something that uh, that occurs again and again. It's for illumination beyond the mundane world, although it starts from that. We, we uncover fascinating connections between lamps and a thing known as the Festival of Lights, which, as I say, was celebrating it in various forms throughout the Egyptian world and beyond. I say, not just for illuminations, this is of spiritual significance, clo closely related to deities, uh, obviously Osiris and Isis being the most famous, but as we'll see, also Horus. The rituals in the Greek magical papyri, uh, papyri the lamp magic or takes quite, there's quite a lot of them. There's, it's almost like a whole book devoted to them within the collection. So you could say their central stage, offering practitioners uh, a glimpse from the classical world into some very, very old magical practices, as long as people have had lights, <laughs> I guess, that they've kind of been using them in their magic. Uh, as I say, with the Festival of Lights had a profound symbolic meaning and transcended the physical realm and gave people access to spiritual truths. Uh, the lamps are also channels of energy. Uh, you'll find this in Egyptian religion and magic were well, more than just simple sources of light. They were channels. Horus is personified in the lamp's flickering flame and in uh, yeah, which, if you think about it, the relationship between certain elements and certain uh, parts of the body the flame is sort of as being particularly associated with vision. Uh, and therefore Horus being as the eye, obviously one of the more famous personifications of, each, uh, of Horus is as the eye. And the eye, if you think about it, is a kind of like a lamp. It's sort of as having a flame within it that shines out. Uh, and therefore it symbolizes enlightenment, the word literally, and protection on the journey through the underworld and the left eye of Horus is especially associated with the moon so you've got the, this association between lights and the lunar cycle as well and for guiding the departed the deceased lamps were used widely in funeral practices and in domestic practices and with this again what we're gonna what came up in the discussion of the ritual that I'm going to share with you as I say, it's the personification, the light itself or the lamp is the personification of the Eye of Horus and it holds immense symbolic power, offering guidance and protection to the deceased on their voyage to the realm of the underworld, which is ruled by the god Osiris. So any rituals to do with funeral practices were often involved lamps and this was something we sort of discovered in the course of uh, doing the research for this ritual but uh, again the image from Abydos as well also uh, it is to do with lights in the in the funeral obviously you need to see where you're going if you're going to safely get through the underworld and uh, that's obvious in ancient Egypt the presentation of lamps is akin to the modern use of candles uh, bridges the gap between the earthly and the divine realm. And that was something, again, that can occur to us and finish all of the what's it, that this is uh, an ancient example of, of something that's very popular in the magical world, which is candle magic. And surprisingly, candle magic even as a candle, because we're talking about lamps, but there's this thing about candle magic as well, which it seems to overlap with. That sort of kind of goes back, you know, way back within the Egyptian tradition. And so even the magical papyri we often look at were written in the Roman era, more or less, you know, to give yourself a little bit of orientation. But the rituals are sort of miniaturized Egyptian rituals that, then you can trace them back thousands of years within the Egyptian culture, which has existed an awful long time. So it's a, a luminous legacy that continues to flicker across time and space. 
And through the lens of our Egyptian magic tradition, we gain insight into this whole significance. As we learned a lot, We'd, the ritual was there to look, teach us things, but even just exploring and preparing for the ritual, we, it, it brought up all sorts of uh, uh, insights, including the fact that candle magic is very, very old type of magic used in divinatory spells rituals invoking the wisdom of Horus, which is what we did. These ancient practices offer modern seekers a bridge to the mystical world of antiquity. So there is a, a way in, you know, there's this something about the use of the light. And not just from the Roman back to the uh, ancient Egyptian, the very ancient Egyptian, but also forward into the medieval period where lamps and candle magic and some other surprising things that come up in the film uh, seem to sort of resonate. So those that that's by way of, of say I wanted to share it with you. As I say, to, to, I, I thought I had to kind of introduce it again, really, so you understand that this was initially designed as a as a postscript, as a discussion of some of the the practicalities of putting this ritual together. So I talked talk initially about how you have to have certain objects and if you don't have the objects then there's a, there's a, always a workaround for that within the Egyptian tradition it, which is very interesting and I talk a little bit about that and then I go on to the lamps uh, and sh you know show the example of the lamp that uh, I hit upon to use and something about the actual confirmation of this lamp rules made a very another very interesting connection that we hadn't thought of before okay so that's the my introduction and i say that i'm going to show a short piece that was made for well not well 30 minute piece that was made for the course on egyptian magic that uh, details of which you'll find on the mandrake website and on uh youtube and that's a, a special private course and there's quite a lot of just public videos connecting with this that i've also put on the on the on the channel and in the notes and whatever so do please check that out and while i'm here just the last thing i'll remind you that uh we if you want to meet some of these magical people including myself in the flesh uh and where we will workshop some of the techniques uh, that, that are featured in, in various films, then there is uh, an opportunity to do that at the Thelemic Symposium, which uh, is coming up in September, in, a, in just under five months' time now, uh, in Oxford, which is a very nice place to visit. And we've got a whole uh, program of very, very interesting practitioners and uh, historians and uh performers uh to do a mixed day of you know talking head type knowledge explanation practical demonstrations and participation and entertainment uh so do please come uh i'll put uh, a a copy of the url for the uh international thelemic symposium uh on this thing i'm sure you can find it online but uh, do make sure it's the right one <laughs> the one in oxford on the autumn uh, equinox that's the 21st of september in a few months time and hope to see you there well hello again this is uh, the promised supplement um, to the other two films or well, videos that i did on the subject of the lamp meditation and uh, looking at them again i could see you might want to i might suggest changing the order maybe it would be better if what i'm gonna say now was uh you knew it before you kind of went through especially the second videos that i put up which can go through the um the ritual itself because per perhaps the way I read it or discussed it was uh, it's not that it's misleading, but uh, perhaps there was other information that you might need. 
to get the sort of context of all of that. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the actual ritual it, it itself and uh, aspects of the, the text. Uh, I'm going to talk about the lamp and, and the wick. And uh, primarily I'm going to talk about what I discovered about the lamp from my researches um, in the library on Friday where I was able to kind of track down this article on uh, an example of, of the lamp uh, that was used in, in Egypt. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. So the first thing, then, so, so to go back to the way I did the ritual, as I was reading the long uh, words of the ritual itself, the kind of strange thing or the 12 way of looking at things about Egyptian ritual texts, especially those of the late period, uh, would be that uh, obviously as people did the ritual, any, any ritual has a sort of set of instructions and the instructions, we would normally separate the instructional bit from the the ritual itself, but it's not always obvious that the Egyptians did that. As they kind of worked with the ritual and copied it out and reflected upon it, they kind of incorporate the instructions into the ritual itself. Now, there are kind of various ways of looking at that, that it could be a sort of a, a mistake or, or the person making the copy of the ritual didn't really understand what they were copying. So for instance, you have these objects, magical objects, in which it says things like make the the make the object, make the statue, I don't know, a cubit high. And that instruction, make the statue a cubit high, will actually be on the box, or be written on the box. So that could be a mistake, but I don't think it is a mistake. I think the way the image magic system works is that the saying of the image, the saying of the instructions is part of the, the ritual itself. And that's because often if you've got to have a particular substance or for a, for a ritual within the Egyptian worldview, uh, so you might say, or oh, get a loaf of bread. But there's this idea that just saying the name loaf of bread is sort of calls to mind the image of it. So it's quite an interesting way of looking at things. And of course, sometimes you could do a thing called a voice offering, which is you just say it. You don't actually have to do the offering. You just have to say, you just make the words. And that's in itself is, is, uh, an, kind of offering so there's a there's an element of that in the ritual i think so when i was going through it and there was a, a long section in which uh it, it in brackets essentially when you look at the ritual in the, in the text it says say it twice that is actually written in in the, the ancient text it, it it will say lord of so and so i haven't got the text in front of me now say it twice so when i'm reading it i'm reading it as if it is an invocation but so so i just say say it twice but of course uh, that, that's the the speed in which i might do the invocation but it is it's not kind of it's both things it's also an instruction to you in your preparation that you're going to say this line twice and maybe I could, in another way, I'd, I would slow down and say, well, this line is said twice. But in, in fact, you do actually, this is an option. I mean, you know, say these are the decisions you might make, but I think you do say it, and I would say it myself. So you, you, there's this long list of things, and you say, say it twice. Now, of course, it is possible to rewrite the ritual and just put each line in twice so that they are physically repeated, and that's an option as well. But in my particular 
way through this ritual, I'm not going to do that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to do say it twice. But I may, in the moment, end up saying it twice as well. You never know. Sometimes when you actually do these rituals, you have to kind of, you get into it and you allow your uh, intuition and emotion to kind of take over a little bit. And sometimes a really good ritual, it, you do make a lot of mistakes in it <laughs> you know, because you become, uh, I remember uh, kind of doing these rituals with people and people always used to say so-and-so, he always gets so emotional in the things you know then he just has to get on with it really so uh oh we accepted that that's the way he did it which might mean that he, he might kind of not do every single line because he was just really getting into it he was kind of improvising so that's kind of quite good okay um so i just wanted to say that so when I go through the ritual, if you play this again, if you play the second film again of, of my kind of going through the ritual, which is not, <laughs> uh, to, which is a mixture of explanation, but also the way I might do it, then then bear in mind that uh, you know th this idea that I'm repeating. Sometimes I'm repeating the instructions, and I'm not consistent. Nobody is ever consistent in consistent in these things is you know it's difficult if you once you get into it when it's kind of got a flow and i think as the number of rituals get repeated they accumulate more and more instructions and if you look at the original text of these things you'll find that the instructions are not it says insert the you would just uh, you, you you can see there's an actual process at work there that we're, we're following. And this is, the, if you read the book that I read ages ago, Starhawk's book, uh, The Spiral Dance, he talks about these rituals that they create and then each year they repeat them and they add a bit more and they change things around. And uh, that thing. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to say that. Uh, it was also suggested to me that by someone who um, looked through the from feedback from people who looked at that particular lesson that I should take the background off for that if I was going to show you an object. So that's what I why I've done that this time. I quite like the background because in a way that's part of the magical techniques that I've been researching is that you should have copies of books around you especially egyptian books if it's an egyptian ritual and that's my kind of homage if you like to the uh, egyptian magical books and the prime what's called the primary corpus the primary collection of texts that the egyptian magicians had to physically surround themselves with so i just have that picture at the back of me but i thought this time i wouldn't so again in in the ritual in the ritual, it, um, there are all sorts of instructions. And I say, with any of these rituals, you, you, you do have to decide beforehand which bits you can do and which bits are not really going to be practical. And that you might have to just accomplish, as I say, as a voice offering, just by saying it rather than actually having the, the physical thing. And that works. And that's quite an interesting, as I say, aspect of Egyptian magic. Uh, yeah, I, I tried to show you was the lamp that I'm actually going to use when I do the ritual in a couple of days' time, and maybe that wasn't very clear. So I've got this kind of quite—I don't know where how it came into my possession, but it's quite a a beautiful kind of Arabic lamp. I think, given that this is a kind of core of Egyptian ritual, is it's a piece of equipment that you might sort out for yourself long term. I'll be on the lookout for something because it's it's obviously one of these important things. The thing about so this light lamp casts rather interesting shadows and highlights when it's lit. I haven't lit it yet. The thing I like about the lamp, uh, which uh, 
I just, it fits it. It's, it's the size of it. I kind of thought it's about the size of a, a cult statue that you might actually have on your, on your altar. You know, it could be, which is one of the stipulations of, of the ritual instruction as well, that the lamp should not just be a functional thing for light. It should sort of be the shape of a god. You see this in, if you go to a Catholic uh, shop that sells candles and stuff, if you're lucky that we did this at the weekend, in fact, where they sell a lot of very useful ritual equipment and very good collection of candles and lights but they also have a lot good collection of statues of saints and and whatever that you could use you could uh, modify them in some way and i they do have some statues which you, uh, statues that you can actually put a light inside uh, so this is which is actually quite an ancient idea because this is the egyptian thing too they have statues in which a light could be put inside it but the other interesting aspect of this, which I'll go into a little bit more in a minute, is about the size of a of, of a human head, and that is uh, also something that would have a resonance within the Egyptian tradition and within it, all this ritual. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, so that's a light. Um, in the ritual instructions that uh, hopefully you'll revise, it it refers to a wick, and the floating wick type of lamp is actually quite an important type of lamp within the Egyptian tradition, and they invented the floating wick, uh, a wick floating in oil. That's one thing. But the other interesting thing that they did was, um, okay, so uh, I was talking about the Egyptian, the lamp that we're going to use for the ritual. And I showed you the lamp. So you have another look. And this one is not an oil lamp, although you it probably could be modified to have an oil lamp with uh, a, an actual wick in it, not a floating wick. That's probably possible as well, but with a, one of those kind of wicks that kind of you get on a hurricane lamp or whatever, which, which are about half a centimetre in width, which if, if you wanted to follow that instruction, particular instruction of uh, <coughs> writing the invocation, writing one of the words of power on a wick in using a special type of ink. So it could be done. Uh, if you use a new wick, you could write it on there before you stick it in the oil, probably the best thing. And that would work. But uh, And then you'd be getting even closer to the original instructions. But realistically, I know that what I'm going to do is use a candle and uh, as i say i've got this i've just taken this out this is the the candle that's already in there uh which i'll probably use because if i put a new one in there it might be a bit too tall but i i don't know it <laughs> i i'm not religious about this idea of that you always have to have a new candle each time in fact, we have some candles on the altars here that last quite a long time. So we tend to light them and blow them out again and uh, and whatever. You just have to be practical about it. So, yeah, this has got a couple of hours of life still in it by the look of it. And if not, so, and it's green as well, which is the other reason why I might carry on and use this and you know i i think there in the ritual there are certain stipulations about what color of things you should use white is all right I, you're supposed to avoid uh red lead in, in the color set in the in the lamp but i think elsewhere it says you can use red ink in the the actual candle anyway check that so what i'm actually going to do 
uh, is I'm going to scratch the name of uh, of of the god into the wax of the candle with a kind of uh, stylus of some sort, and then I'll probably rub a bit of either some soot or some red chalk or white chalk and how I decide to do it into the letters and so it'll actually be on the candle which is my adaptation of this and the use of a candle uh, and just to interject again in in the film that you've just been, been listened to I talk about making the images or, or the name the main name of power from a from a ritual and placing that on onto uh, the candle uh, in an act of candle magic which is in, then put inside the lamp which we sort of discussed in some detail uh, the hieroglyph in the ritual itself it, it gives you a name but then it, it spells that out in what are called pseudo hieroglyphs or fancy script of some sort and it's not possible this is another interesting aspect of uh, Egyptian magic that we've kind of uh, elucidated that these ha these are actually actual hieroglyphs from the Egyptian tradition but at the time in which they were made or, or in the, Ro the Roman era the the knowledge of actually how you kind of pronounce these things was not uh, was not known so they weren't necessarily spelling out the name of power but they were put in five symbols that somehow kind of relate to uh, the the overall ritual, and the symbols are quite straightforward and uh, to, to do. And like a lot, of, well, the hieroglyphs are, are not too bad if you know what they are. But they, you could work this out for you for yourself, and it was suggesting that's what people did. And the images in hieroglyphic form that you marked on the on the candle were. Basically, a loaf of bread, which is an offering thing, really, like a French loaf, essentially, but it makes the uh, hieroglyph hotet, which means offering. So, th th there you go, that's interesting too. A hieroglyph of the eye, specifically the eye of Horus, so a, a little emblem or, of the eye in one form or another, either a simple form or you can do the more complicated eye of Horus, you know, with a little bit of practice. An image of the scarab, which is uh, to do with becoming and rebirth uh, and all the rest, was again, and the sun rising, which again is like a light, a lamp. The image of, uh, of just an X, we would call it an X, uh, and that's quite likely that that is a is a kind of simplified form of the hieroglyph of two arrows crossed to make an X, which brings to mind the goddess Neith, uh, who is show whose emblem is of two crossed arrows, and she also has a connection with this particular ritual. So that's probably why that's there. And the final image is uh, the image of basically set in the form of a dog sitting down with his tail up in the air um, and this was another mystery that was strange for a ritual that's often connected supposed to be the personification of Horus and Osiris to some extent in the that the the, the name of set is repeated several times in the ritual and is actually marked onto the lamp itself. Uh, and there are various explanations of why that is, and that's not unusual either. That's obviously an important part of the ritual because it, judging by the fact that it occurs in several other contexts. So there you go. There's your your five signs that you can, you know, using hieroglyphs. You can't translate that as an Egyptian word. It doesn't quite work linguistically, but as signs, as pure symbols, it certainly makes a lot of sense other than a lamp is strangely enough also uh, sanctified for want of a better word for uh, verified by the 
older version of the ritual that I found, strangely enough. So I'll, as I say, oh, that's clear. So there's my lamp. Can't put the candle back inside. I'm going to mark the candle at some point with the with one of the main names of uh, of God, the one, the first one, or, or of the, the divine force that is going to be used in this ritual. And as I say, this lamp has uh, added facility. It's cast quite a lot of things, but I can also open the aperture at the front and shine it onto the north wall i think where we want the images to appear uh, i'll probably do a bit of experimenting to get the to get the kind of right effect for this ritual so i may well update the data on what how i did it in the other end but it's a good idea for you to kind of make your own experiments with this sort of technique and uh, what, take it in, bearing in mind the kind of ancient views. Okay, so to go to the Egyptian example that I mentioned, well, they're all Egyptian examples, but this is from the New Kingdom. So this is the time of Ramesses II, most likely. And where this sort of ritual was, um there's an example of it there are lots of examples of it in fact what i'll have to do is um i'll put another image i put an image uh, edit an image and stick it into this film a bit later uh, because i'm not really able to show you the drawing a depiction of the lamp that was used in the new kingdom example which is as i say is i think say about 1400 bce but so that's what's that about three three and a half thousand years ago <laughs> this ritual uh was being performed in people's in the tombs this example but in people's houses and it says uh new kingdom of the new year so it's, it's done in the new year it's uh, and then it says making an offering which it, it is a in egyptian hotep dinesu an offering that the king makes to a cyrus and this is a scribe of the arch lord of the two lands on a particular day which is new year's day uh so a special day anointing with uh, oil and kindling uh, and depositing offerings to the god of cyrus in sunrise too and there is actually then a, a long spell uh, it's uh, which is again it's got so many interesting aspects on uh, on this uh, it says hail to the old good candle of Osiris. So there's a question to see three and a half thousand years ago whether they actually had candles or not. The, the, then the candle technology is usually ascribed to the Roman era, but they obviously had something using animal fat and maybe rush light. So maybe they take a bull rush, soak it in fat, and somehow light it. So it's quite not as functional as other sorts of things. And people took a, a group of these rush lights so a, a kind of fat a bunch of uh, goose fat appended on a stick and they without maybe they took them to the tombs uh placed them in a convenient sort of notch and then lit them and said the spell and it probably wouldn't burn for very long hail to thee eye of horus so the candle so is a jet dressed as the eye of horus which is something i mentioned before uh who give, gives gods uh in darkness who guides gods in darkness and guides osiris from his resting place to wherever he desires to be <clears throat> i supply this good lamp so i'm bringing you this good lamp to osiris with fresh uh fat uh goose fat in it uh geb which is sacred to the god geb of course being uh goose but and also to thy mother knew it 
Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephis, that they may brighten uh, and open for thee with their five fingers of the olive. So there's like they're compared to the five fingers, perhaps olive oil as well is used in the lamp, uh, by which the mouths of the gods are open, which gives given to the earth in the fields on this prospicious auspicious night. Uh, there to be given to the fresh water of the gods, which are the, and then it mentions the indestructible stars. May this good candle of Osiris be eternal. I'm sorry, I'm faltering a bit because I only just transcribed this and it's, it's a little, uh, yeah, I'm having to kind of edit it as I go along. So again, the candle of Osiris to thrive as Atom thrives. May this good candle uh, light your way as Thoth as well. May this good lamp of Osiris Thoth thrive in the day boat and the night boats. Uh, may you never fail or ever be destroyed. The twice pure Osiris is open to thee. The earth is open to thee. The roads in the necropolis are open to thee. Uh, and may you stroll with the lords of eternity who will give you water, bread, beer, milk, and all these other good things. The other, only other thing, all right, so lots of that is fairly standard, but we can learn lots from it. So I just wanted you to know that this ritual that comes from the sort of classical period, the Roman period, if you like, also has this very ancient um, thousand uh, at least 1500 years earlier for for them uh precedent and was obviously a common ritual and the the, the other strange thing about this is that when the image that this is on the wall of someone's tomb and there are lots of examples of these candle lanterns the image is uh very very similar to what's called the fetish of Abydos. Uh, and the fetish of Abydos, which is the sacred center of, of, of Osiris, is actually the severed head of Osiris, sort of covered and um, put on a kind of stick or a stand of some sort. Thus, the idea that the lamp is like a head uh, in some way, it, the, so the image is of the head of Osiris. And that has resonances down the centuries as well, because you often hear about magicians in the medieval period and other periods having some sort of mechanical head. Uh, and I think this is what it must be referring to, the mechanical head of Osiris, which is depicted in medieval things. And as I say, it can be opened to allow the eye of Horus, whose function is to look for his father uh, and to shine light in, in the darkness. It's one of the important functions of, of Hassel, which is why I, uh, of Horus rather, why I'd link this particular uh, technique with the month of associated with the god Horus, which is what we're in now. Uh, so all in all, a, a, a ritual, a very common ritual for magicians in the ancient world, one of which has a long history uh, and, and brings up all sorts of important um, sort of psychological and magical things and, and is used to because there's this mysterious process, one of the things, that, again, of, of Horus, is this mysterious process of the transfer of energy from w one uh, entity, his father, to Horus. Horus becomes Osiris, Osiris becomes Horus. This is one of the mysteries and whatever that we're reflecting upon and that we might ask. So it's... It's a trans induction technique. It's a, a, a technique that is supposed to impinge upon your dreams 
uh, and bring to mind dreams is associated with a kind of assuming a, a death posture as well. So all in all, I mean, I'm not saying you can it, uh, bring all of those things to mind, but you're making a start. This is uh, all, from quite a simple technique, an awful lot of uh, Egyptian theology and uh, philosophy is brought together. So do please have another look at, at the ritual. And uh, so you're going to have to make decisions and work out how much of this and how, how you approach. But certainly just th as of all Egyptian things, even just thinking about it and saying it is a form of um, performance. This is very interesting in its own right. Okay, uh, thank you for listening again, and uh, good luck with that. If you're wondering what all this thunder, footsteps thundering around the room at various points as I speak, it's uh, it's Gia, who's the kind of Siamese puss who always gets very excited when things are happening. Uh, all things are moved around so i moved the computer where she's used to being in one place so she's having a bit of a crazy half hour seems appropriate really okay send empty